Well, good morning, Community Bible Church. I am so excited that I get to be here with you again on this Sunday morning service, November the 12th, and I I just can't tell you how excited and how honored, uh, and I count it such a privilege to be able to be here with you. I want to say thank you to my dad for allowing me to be back and to, to bring a word uh, from the Lord that, that I hope can reach out and touch us this morning, and that we would open up, and we would listen, and that we would get uh, something from it, and that we would be able to leave a walk away changed in Jesus' name this morning. Um, I, I, again, thank you so much for letting me be here, uh, and I, I want to go ahead and just jump right in the text that I want to read. Uh, I'm going to be reading from Genesis chapter 15. And I'm going to start in verse 7. We're going to go all the way through 21. Uh, to set the stage a little bit, we have Abram. This is before his name was changed to Abraham. And he is talking with God. He's having a conversation with God. And we're going to pick it up here in verse 7. Uh, and he, that is God, says to him, which is Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He said, O Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he didn't cut the birds. The birds of prey came down on the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for four hundred years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried in, at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I, give, I have given you this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenite, and the Kenizzite, and the Cadmonite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Rephaim, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. Now what I want to talk about this morning and get into is the construction of a covenant. We want to look at the building blocks that go in place to build a covenant. What is a covenant and how do we establish covenant with the Lord just like Abram did here in this passage of scripture. So we're going to get into it in just a second. But before we do, I'd like to pray and I'd like to open up this morning and invite God to be here with us and to lead and guide us as we go through this. Heavenly Father, we thank you you so much for your presence here with us this morning. God, we ask in Jesus' name that you would lead this message, that you would guide this message, that it would fall upon the ear that it needs to fall on, and God, that you would open hearts to receive and apply, God, the, the, exactly what you're trying to say this morning. God, we want to be attentive to you. We want to hear what you have to say. We thank you so much for your word. As we get into it, just illuminate each passage to us, and it's in Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen. Thank you so much for your help, Lord. So our context here, we have Abram is having a conversation with God. They are such good friends. God has called Abram his friend, and they, they've done so many awesome things together. God had called Abram out of of the Chaldeans and had taken him to a place beyond anything that he could have even thought. And we know that Abram was a little bit up in his years uh, when God had asked him to leave. He was 75 years old, and we know that Isaac is born at 99 years old. And in this passage of Scripture, Isaac is not yet born, so we know that it's after he's left, but it's before Isaac's born. So it's sometime in, in that space of time. God has told Abram so many things that he's going to do in and through Abram's life. And Abram is going to have a son and continue uh, uh, in, a, in a lineage that is going to be more numerous than all the stars. God has promised Abram so many things. And Abram believes God. I mean, just 
to have a, a relationship with God so much, so that so deep, so that whenever He tells you something, you, you believe it just automatically. It's it's just a belief that you have that nothing else can supersede it. And as a matter of fact, if we look at the previous scripture in chapter fifteen and verse six, it says it tells us that uh, Abram believed in the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Um, Abram has just such a strong faith in God that he's willing to do whatever God asks. And when God says, hey, here's what I want you to do, Abram says, I'm in. I'm willing to go do whatever you want. I'll do it. Um, And so that's kind of the context. That's where we're going to kind of leap into it here. Um, I do want to contrast here real quick the difference between a covenant and a contract because in our world today, we have contracts. We deal with contracts. Everything that we do, we almost can't even uh, wake up in the morning unless we have sign a contract so that we can wake up. Um, but I do want to contrast and, and kind of uh, d- determine what is the difference between the two. Now, a covenant is a relationship between uh, two or more partners and God. It can be one person and God, or it can be two or more and God. Um, to make a promise to each other and work together to reach a common goal. Now, they're often accompanied by oaths, signs, and ceremonies. I got that description from the Bible Project on uh, thebibleproject.com. I felt like that was very fitting. Um, A contract, on the other hand, is a written or spoken agreement, especially one concerning employment, sales, or tenancy that is intended uh, to be enforceable by law. So that comes from Oxford Languages, uh, the, the description there. Uh, so on the one hand, we have the covenant, which really is a, it's an invitation to uh, be something more than just an agreement between two people. When we have a human agreement, we have opportunity for failure. And when God's in the middle of it, we invite a perfect being. We invite uh, a completely flawless and un- un- unability to fail into that agreement and that provides a foundation and a security and and things like that that a contract just can't do. Uh, Here are some differences between the two. A covenant is an agreement, like I said, with God and not with another of equal status, while uh, a contract is an agreement with another of equal human status that is legally binding. A covenant is founded and based on love and commitment, whereas a contract is based on mistrust often gotten into for the protection of one or both parties. So when we have a covenant, we do it because this is what we want to do. And failure would be an absolutely crushing blow. It would it would be grief because the love that we have for the other person and how we're getting into this covenant is... It just, it is, is so much greater. Whereas with a contract, we sign our, our life away. We put our, our, our signature down on a piece of paper out of mistrust because somebody else can't trust us. They have to have something backing up our word. Our word just isn't good enough as a human being because we have opportunity to fail. And it's vice versa. It works both ways. Maybe it's, it's us who's having somebody else sign a contract. And there's nothing wrong with having a contract at all. There's nothing wrong with any of that. Uh, these are just differences. Uh, a, co- a covenant oftentimes has no com- time commitment attached to it. It can be generational, but for the most part, covenants last they're perpetual. They're just ongoing. They continually go and go and go, whereas a contract has a time commitment attached. At this date, at this time, on in this year, this agreement is over. We're going to shut it down at that point. And usually, if, if we're talking about a sale, we're talking about at the end of uh, whenever the money has all been paid or whenever we've reached a, 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 an amount that's acceptable, whatever it is, or if it's a service that's being provided, then at this date, at this time, then we're going to part ways because we're, not long, we're no longer going to need those particular services. Um, here, here's something that I had found on uh, a, a website called upcouncil.com. It says, while a contract is legally binding, while a contract is legally binding, a covenant is a spiritual agreement. A contract is, a, is an agreement between parties, while a covenant is a pledge. A contract is an agreement you can break, while a covenant is a perpetual promise. It, it just continues to go. You seal a covenant while you sign a contract. So there are just some differences that I wanted to kind of cover here, and why Abram making a covenant with God was such a big deal. 
Um, so now that we've covered that, I do have four points that I want to uh, I want to go over and uh, on how we build this covenant, how we construct this covenant based on what we read here in Genesis chapter 15. The first one is going to be God's responsibility. God gets to set the terms. In Genesis chapter 15 and 7, it says, And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. God gave Abraham a promise, Abram a promise at the time, of what he was going to do concerning the land. God gets to set the terms. He gets to state what he's going to promise. Now, we can... We can try and say, God, if you'll do this, but bargaining with God usually isn't, it doesn't work out very well. I've been there. I've said, God, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. And, and God respects that, but he, he really wants us to, to hear, to listen, and to obey whenever he asks us to do something. It's his terms. And his terms really are the only ones that matter. Uh, God gives, God has so much that he wants to do in our lives, just like he did in Abram's life. His plans are so much greater and far surpass anything that we could ever ask or imagine. I know it doesn't always look like it from the outset. There are times whenever we get into situations that we wonder, God, if this is your plan, this doesn't seem like it's a very good plan. But God's plan is always good. No matter what, he's only got the best for us in mind. He is our father. And as a father, I can tell you, I only want the best for my kids. I don't want them to ever have to do anything that isn't the best. And if me, who's wicked and evil, only wants the best things for my kids, how much more does God want the best for his kids? I found a quote here from Timothy Keller that says, If we knew what God knows, we would ask exactly for what God gives. Every time that we have an opportunity to ask for something from God, if we knew what he knew about us, then we would only ask for what he would give us. We'd only want our will to be his will every time because that, that's only going to be the best for us. The second thing is our responsibility. We get to offer the sacrifice. So in Genesis 15, verse 9 through 10, it says, So he, being God, said to Abram, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought all these things to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. So Abram is following God's direction for what God is wanting. So again, God gets to set the terms. He says, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I want to promise you. Abram in between there says, how do I know this to be true? And God says, bring me these things. We're going to set up a sacrifice here. And uh, I know this kind of sounds uh, weird and, and, and a little bit off. Um, I, I was reading a commentary by uh, a guy named David Gusick, I believe is how his name's pronounced, and he said that this seems more like a grocery list for a pagan ritual. But really, this is kind of a common practice around that time. Uh, according to my research, uh, you would be able to cut the animal, the sacrifice, sacrificial animal, in two, lay them open. There, you could make a little trough in the in the dirt, and the blood would pour into this trough. You and the other party who you're making a covenant with would walk through that trough. And your what is being said is that whenever I walk through this blood, I'm willing to be the blood that's here if this fails. I'm willing to let this blood be my blood if I ever fail this covenant. So basically putting my life on the line saying, if this fails, then my life is, is worth whatever is right here. And uh, so this is kind of a common practice around this time. Uh, Anytime that there was a wedding or or, or things like that, uh, evidently there would be fathers that would do this. There would be other, anytime that a a contract would need to be signed or or a, a covenant would need to be made, then they would do something similar to this. Through all of that, when God says he's going to do something, he always asks us to partner with him and to, to go to work with him in whatever he's doing with us. He could do it all himself. God's God. God is, is so much higher than anything that we could do. But for him to invite us and say, look, Abram, I know that, that I could handle all of this and I could tell you, but it wouldn't mean as much as if 
me and you went through it together. Because you're my friend. Because you and I have relationship. I want to do this with you. So God invites Abram, can you do this? Can you set up this sacrifice so that whenever we establish this covenant and whenever we actually confirm it, then you'll know that I'm being serious about this and that I only want the best for you. Um, Now, whenever God asks us to go to work with him and he asks us to partner with him and whatever his plan is, the work will often require a sacrifice on our part. Just like Abram had to, to... go back to his resources and find uh, some animals and, and give them up so that God and him can establish this covenant. He's going to ask us to sacrifice uh, so- something that we have. That could be our time. That could be our finances. That could be our resources. Something that we can give up. Here's what I have to say about that. Everything that we have that's good comes from God anyway. It's just a matter of giving it back to him, saying, God, None of this is worth anything to me here more than what you are. You're way more important than anything that I could hold here on this earth, whether that's my time and do it for whatever I want to do, I'd rather give it to you. Whether it's my finances, if finances are a touchy subject, I, I get that because we're, with the prices of everything right now, it's hard to just maintain a living. But God knows all that. God has all that. He understands all that. And for us to give it to him is saying, look, God, I know that you're going to provide me with more anyway. I know that you're going to make sure that I never have to go hungry. I know that you're going to make sure that I always have something to do. And so I'm willing to give of my finances because you're a good God and you're a good father and you're going to make sure I'm taken care of. If it's our resources, other things that we have, sharing what we have with others or giving it to to God is just, it's the ultimate sacrifice we could make. Uh, anything that we have, it all anything that's good comes from God. It's worth giving back to him. It's worth saying, God, I know, I know that I've got it, but here it is, offering it up to him. The third thing, our responsibility, we protect our sacrifice from anything trying to take it away. In verse 11, it says, The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. Abram Abram took action to protect his sacrifice while he waited on God to complete what he started. It seems like we're always in this situation, right? We're waiting on God to do something. God's promised something. He's given us a word from somebody or directly to us to say, this is what I want to see in your life. And we're waiting. We've given our time. We've given, we've given stuff. And, and we're just waiting now. We're waiting on, on something to happen. And at this point, this is whenever we have an enemy who wants to come in and try to take that away from us. Who, because his, his whole goal, he only has one thing on his mind, and that is, I want your death. Spiritually, physically, all of it. I just want you dead. Now, he uses so many tools to try and get into our, our sacrifice. Our job is to guard it, to protect it. We pray over it. We say, God, I know you've promised this to me. I know that you have this in mind for me. I know that this is the plan that you have for my life. And I have an enemy coming, trying to take it away. So God, I'm going to give it to you right now. And I'm going to let you handle it. And I'm going to I'm, I'm going to make sure that I hold everything that I can at bay. But God, I know that you've got me. And I know that you're going to protect this. And I know that you're going to take care of it. Now, God could, God could have just snapped his fingers and the birds could have went away. But he didn't do that. He let Abram protect. He let Abram work while he was uh, waiting on God to deliver what he said he was going to deliver. Um, there's so many. There's so much scripture that tells us how we can respond anytime that birds come in and try to take our sacrifice, try to eat up what we have. There is so much scripture, and 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 we could go anywhere. We could go to uh, you know guarding our hearts, guarding our minds, uh, putting a watch over what we say. There's so many things that that could be used. But this verse here in James chapter four and verse seven, uh, I just found to be the it, it encompasses everything. I feel like, and it says our job is simply to resist the devil and he will flee if we resist our enemy and that's all abram's doing right now he's resisting get away birds he took off his sandal and and waved and said shoo that's a shoe joke if if you got that um the last thing that i got number four god's responsibility 
He confirms and completes the covenant in Genesis 7, 17 through 21. Now this is this is so amazing, and this this just gets to me every time that I read it. Uh, verse 17, it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite and the Kenizzite and the Cadmonite, and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Rephaim, and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Girgashite and the Jebusite. So, when it says here in verse 18 that, uh, or sorry, in verse 17, that there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. This is God representing himself in forms that we can understand. Well, how do we know that a smoking oven and a flaming torch is God? If we read later on in Genesis and then into the Exodus when Moses is leading these same descendants of Abraham out of Egypt and they're being they're being chased by Egyptians. They've got so many things that are, are, are trying to get at them. And they're being led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. We got smoke. We got fire. These two things God uses so many times. He, he uses these two things to represent himself in so many instances of scripture. And so that, that was kind of, that was just something I had to research. And, and, and I just loved whenever I read the correlation between those two. Um, God's presence appears as a cloud so many times over the tent of meeting with Moses. And, and in, in scripture, we read the psalmist tells us that God, our God, is a consuming fire. There's just so many different instances where God appears in the fire and in the cloud. Um, but here's the thing that always gets me about this passage right here. Only God walks through the sacrifice. He doesn't let Abram walk through because he knows something about what he's trying to tell Abram. And that is that, Abram, you're a man and you have the potential for failure. But I'm God and I don't have that potential. I can't fail. If I said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If, I, if you say that it's going to happen and you put your name on it, you have an opportunity to, to come up short. But I can't do that because I'm God. God takes his agreements with us so seriously that he's willing to put himself on the line if it fails. But he's God and he can't fail. That means that whenever God gives us a promise or an agreement, we have this confidence that he's able and faithful to keep it because he's God and he can't fail. He doesn't have that capability within, within him. He cannot fail. When he says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. As I read this, I go back in time from right now, about 2,000 years, to Jesus. Jesus is on the earth and we know that he's human because he's born of Mary. But then he grows up and he begins to do these miracles, these amazing things, and he's doing them in the name of his God, the Jewish God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's doing all these amazing miracles. He claims divinity. He tells people that he is the Messiah that's been appointed, that's been waited for, that's been prophesied about. And the leaders of the Jewish people say, you know what, that's not right. And because they don't like what he's doing, they decide they're going to put him to death. And he, he, they put him to death on a cross. As he's there on the cross, he talks to his father. and He says, why have you forsaken me? And at that moment, I can just see God the Father. The scripture says, whenever Jesus was hanging on that cross, that the heavens were opened up, they were split, and God the Father walked through the split heaven. And then it says that the veil in the temple where God's presence rested was split open, and God walked through that split veil. And then he walked through the blood of his son Jesus. Why? Because he wanted to be able to get to you and to me. He wanted to be able to get to not just his the descendants of Abraham that were going to be as numerous as the stars, but he wanted to get to you, and he wanted to get to me. He wanted us to know that we could talk to him the same way that Abraham did that we could be friends of his just like Abram was he wanted us to be his he wanted us to have relationship with him that means so much to me that God would see me and think I love Drew so much 
that I would have relationship with him. And he loves you so much that he wants relationship with you. It's very easy to do. If, you, if you've not made a decision to follow Christ, then it's so easy to do. It's a matter of talking to him and saying, Jesus, I know I haven't lived the life that you want me to. These are some things that I've done that I know wouldn't make you happy, wouldn't make you proud. But I want to turn from that today. I want, to, I want to leave all of that behind, and I want to follow you from here on out. Whenever Jesus went and found the disciples, his disciples, the 12 guys that were going to follow him, he said, I want you to come and follow me. He invited them into relationship. That's what relationship with Jesus looks like. It looks like following him. And that's what I want to invite you to this morning. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with him, it's just that simple. All you have to do is talk to him. And if you have a hard time with it, don't, and you can't quite understand it, put a comment down in the, in the comment section. Tell Pastor Frazier, I want to have a relationship with Jesus and I need some help doing it. And he'd be more than happy to get a hold of you, to talk to you, to chat with you, to call you, whatever it takes. He will make sure, we will make sure that you find a way to, to be introduced to Jesus. Now, maybe you're sitting out there uh, and listening and God's promised you something. Maybe you've already decided to follow Jesus. Maybe that, that part's already been done. I just want to encourage you this morning that God said it. He set the terms. You obey. That's all you have to do. You protect what you've set up. Your sacrifice, you protect it. Make sure the enemy can't get to it. And he's God. He can't fail. He's God. He can't fail. I hope that's been an encouraging word for you this morning. I'm so glad that I got the opportunity to be with you this morning. We love you so much. And I just want to pray uh, over us this this morning uh, in closing and just uh, ask God to to be with us as we go into the rest of our, our day and the rest of our week. Father, we just invite you, and we're just so thankful, God, first, Lord, that you would be willing to call us your friend, that you would be willing to invite us into relationship with you, that you would be willing to to establish us as a part of your kingdom and as a part of your family. Thank you, God. Lord, as we go into our week, Lord, uh, if there's anybody who doesn't know you, God, I pray they would make that decision to follow you this morning. I pray that they would feel that draw within them and that they would, they would, decide right now that they're going to follow you. At the end of this, we know that as we stand before you, the only question that's going to matter is, what did you do with Jesus? So God, this morning, I just pray that if there's anybody out there that wants to make a decision, God, that they would do that right now to follow Jesus. And for others that are waiting on you and the plan that you have for them, God, I pray encouragement over them. I pray blessing over them. God, I ask in Jesus' name that you would provide them with with a supernatural word from you, God. God, and a supernatural boost of encouragement, God. Lord, and we thank you so much again that you're with us every day, that you love us, God. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray this morning. Amen. Thank you so much and God bless.